Now, do you want the real story or are you doing a puff piece? No, I want the real story. Okay. The real story is pretty gnarly. When Whitesnake's Here I Go Again hit MTV in 1987, the killer combination of a hard rock anthem, a beautiful woman, two jaguars and a shocking amount of hairspray blew everyone's minds, sending Whitesnake to the top of the charts and crowning singer David Coverdale and his soon-to-be wife, Tanya Katane, the king and queen of rock and roll. Everyone you know knows this song. And from the hood top writhing to the reckless driving, I doubt you'll find anyone that can't describe what happens in the video. A video that almost didn't get made. As promised, this is the real story behind Here I Go Again. A story that starts a few years earlier with the man who signed Whitesnake to Geffen Records in the early 80s. I'm John Kolodner. I formerly was a famous A&R guy. Most people know me for Aerosmith and Cher. Now I'm retired, but I was responsible for a lot of people's careers. In the summer of 1980, I get a call from David Geffen. And he called me, he said, you want, you want to come work for me? I was 30 years old, and I thought, sure, why not? When I went to Geffen, I told him that I wanted to sign Sammy Hagar. I also begged him to sign uh, Phil Collins. Peter Gabriel was also available, and he picked Peter Gabriel. He thought he'd be a bigger star. David Geffen was almost always right about everything all the time. One of the few instances he was wrong. So Whitesnake was a band that was, you know, fairly successful to my way of thinking. They had David Coverdale, who was one of the great singers of the rock era. He led a really nice but incredibly average band. At the time, he used a really second-rate producer. Great guy, but not a great producer, so... I had to start to change all this. He wanted to make it in the United States, and I said, the only way you're going to do that is really to come try to make a record for American rock radio. You can just tell when somebody was poised for the peak of their career. Hard rock historian and radio host Eddie Trunk. A lot of the bands that he brought to the label were bands that had had previous histories with other labels, but maybe didn't quite make it all the way. So he would go and maybe bring in some outside songwriters or whatever critiques and whatever commentary he would give and help shape that band and help break them in America. So he did that on more than one occasion with some different artists. Whitesnake did very well throughout Europe, uh, virtually nothing in America, nothing even close to a hit or radio play for them in America. You know, so now you've got this huge rock label in America tweaking the sound and putting a fresh coat of paint on the band, all tied into kind of like the official launch of Whitesnake in the U.S. There were very few areas in which Kaladner was not hands-on. My involvement was complete. The music, the choice of songs, the choice of producer, how the songs were done, the album covers, the artwork, the photographer, the artist, and the video director, and usually the treatment. I had met this guy, John Sykes, between how he played and how he sung and what he looked like. It was just incredible. And, and I decided that I would put him with David Coverdale to write the next record. Bon Jovi set the tone for what White Snake had to be. So they went off in 1985 to write the record. And Mike Stone was going to be involved because I had had a lot of success with him. He was a drinker, but he was also a genius. Sessions went really well with uh, Mike Stone recording, but there got to be increasing tension between David Coverdale and John Sykes. And John Sykes, you know, was closer to Mike Stone or seemed to have a better relationship, and Coverdale started to get more and more unhappy about it. But I think the biggest thing was... Without Martin Birch, who was the original producer, Coverdale could not sing the record. David Coverdale from a 1987 interview with Dante Benuto. Now, the new album wasn't a quick in-and-out job, as we say. It took quite a long time in coming. Was part of that due to the problems you had with your voice? Uh, the majority of it was, yes. I was, uh, through dreadful illness, I was confined to base for most of 1986. It was due to your sinus, wasn't it? And when you mentioned sinus to people in the music business, they give you some very suspicious looks, don't uh, they? Yes, there's a, there's a kind of movement of invisible spoons toward the nostril. No, it was absolutely not 
Uh, I have the doctor's reports for anybody who ever even suggests anything like that. So this is like now it's the end of 85 and he thinks she has trouble with his voice. So I take him right down the street here to Joe Sugarman, best ear, nose and throat guy in the world. He needed some kind of nasal surgery. So he had that done. And the studio bills just kept adding up. Kolodner enlisted other A-list producers, including Ron Nevison. Tried with Ron Nevison. Couldn't sing the songs with Ron Nevison. I knew it was a mental thing. I was doing everything I could. Every remedy. I had every kind of holistic person. I, I mean, I, I, I did everything. Eddie Rosenblatt, who was the president of Geffen Records and Geffen, that's the only time they were really on my ass ever. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, this is now going on two years on this record. Geffen Records is waiting for this record and including EMI worldwide. It's the one year in 1986 I didn't have a hit. Geffen Records at the time was losing money because of a lack of delivery of the White Snake record. Here's my artist. Can't sing the record. I'm trying to clean up Aerosmith from drugs with Tim Collins. I'm going to get fired over this incident. Fortunately, after surgery, I got my voice back. Uh, I recorded the vocals in August uh, 86. And when it was uh, completed, I sat and looked very darkly at the people who'd taken advantage of me during my problem. So uh, I moved them out of my life and closed the book. Among those that Coverdale closed the book on? Guitarist and co-writer John Sykes and producer Mike Stone. Drummer Ainsley Dunbar and bassist Neil Murray were also let go, leaving Whitesnake a band of one. Once he decided he could sing it, he sang it perfectly. It was a make-or-break album, because I, I went into 1987, $3 million personally in debt, related to professional work. No income was coming in for the band. He was getting poorer by the minute. Geffen Records put all this money into the record, had no idea how it was going to do, really didn't want to pay for the video. The video was for the album's lead single, called Still of the Night. Between Marty Kalner's faith in doing it, the money that I, you know, got together myself and the money that Eddie Rosenblatt and Geffen Records put in, we got it done. I'm Marty Kalner, and I'm a director most well-known for my music videos and my big comedy and concert specials for HBO. When I started at HBO, I worked there in 1975. I was responsible for the feel, for the look. That music, you know, da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da. I had that commission. One night in the early 80s, Colner saw director Russell Mulcahy's video for the Kim Carnes song, Betty Davis Eyes. I was making a very good living, and I was kind of king of the world. I was under contract to HBO at the time. I was uh, in bed in L.A. watching something called the Z Channel, and I saw this video come on, and I saw this guy breaking every rule, jump cutting and crossing the line and... It was just so creative that I kept watching it and watching it. And then I said to my wife, I have to go do this. I want to quit and go do this. And, you know, we're living in a big house. And she said, go, go do it. I went to New York. I met with Amon Erdogan. And he said, I have three different bands. You want to do videos, pick one. One was a band from Australia called In Excess. Another one was a band from New Orleans called Zebra. And he said, I got this bar band I don't know what to do with. And it was Twisted Sister. So the first video I did was, we're not going to take it. And then my phone for the next 12 or 13 years never stopped ringing. No agent, no manager, no nothing. Just MTV. I had been working a lot with a manager named Howard Kaufman. Kaufman and Kalodner, who had done a lot together, said, we have this band, White Snake. Now, when I met Coverdale, he had $5 in his wallet and a condom. We went to lunch, and he says, I'm embarrassed, but you have to pay. And they asked me to do this video called In the Still of the Night. And I liked the song. And 
And so I said, uh, okay, let's do it. White Snake really wasn't White Snake. They were like Milli Vanilli because the guys in my video were not the guys on the album. Coverdale needed a band put together and quick, but putting together new bands was one of John Kalodner's specialties. After making a few calls, his fantasy lineup of White Snake was arranged, and they met each other for the first time on the set of the Still of the Night video. And we shot this, like, nine-minute song. When I got to the editing room, I realized these guys didn't relate to each other. They didn't even know each other. So I basically had nine minutes of stills, people posing. And I said, this is not going to work. I need another layer. I said, listen, I said, I can do this on 16-millimeter film. I need about $35,000. I'll add a layer of jazz, which is what my son's name became because I started doing all these jazz days, and they became very popular videos, which is what I would usually go in with a storyboard, but then I'd do a day of just whatever was in my head. David Geffen, Eddie Rosenblatt, and everybody else at Warner Brothers and Geffen and their man Howard Kaufman said, fuck him, he's done, we're not interested. Just go with what you got. They had had enough of Coverdale. I kind of liked him. I knew his career was over. He had no car insurance, and he was living in the Mondrian Hotel. He couldn't check out. He was making commercials for the New York Seltzer Company. The original New York Salsa, now available everywhere. But I liked him at the time, and I liked the song. He said, Marty, what am I going to do? So I said to my wife, should I loan him the money to finish this video? She said, what do you believe in? I said, I think I can do something that'll make him really popular. She says, go ahead. Coincidentally, he came through my house one night with Tawny Katane. I go with David to Marty's house uh, the night before they were going to shoot. Mind you, I had already done Bachelor Party. I had already done a bunch of films, so I wasn't, I wasn't hurting. I walk in, and Marty immediately looks at me and goes, you're her. And I'm like, who's she? She's, he said, I want you to be in the video. At the time, like television just wasn't cool. I wasn't going to do anything that was going to go on TV. I was kind of like up in the air whether I should do this or not, but... I was dating him, and I was in love with him, and so I said, okay, I'll, I'll do it. So I lent him the money, and we did this other layer. Like always, I had autonomy. Nobody was over my shoulder, so I edited together what I thought was a really hot video, sent it into MTV. Phil Carson, who was, you know, like Zeppelin and all these people's manager, he was in a guy named Sam Kaiser's office who was running MTV at the time. And this video came on, and he told Kaiser, he said, you know, Led Zeppelin would die for this video. Kaiser said, really? He said, yeah. He said, okay, I'm going to make it hip clip of the week. And the next thing I knew, he sold a main records in 10 days. David Geffen was painting the building. He was almost out of business. And White Snake, instead of having nothing, we're now playing 18,000-seat arenas. White Snake spent a lot of time on the road this year. They started out as the opening act on Motley Crue's tour, and later in the year, they went on to do a headlining tour of their own. And they'll be playing some more shows in the U.S. in 1988. Here's the first of the three White Snake videos in the countdown, in at number 35. Eddie Trunk. White Snake, beyond getting a music makeover, they certainly got a fashion makeover and a visual makeover to bring them up to what was happening at the time in the mid to late 80s. The new bands at that time, you know, they were kids in their early 20s. He was an older guy. By the time 87 rolls around, he's already got a uh, 12, 15-year history. Artists from the 70s, a lot of them struggled greatly in the 80s because it was the same scenario. Here's these, these older guys, and then all of a sudden you got these young, good-looking kids running around. And, okay, how do we compete with that? Well, we're going to start throwing on the makeup and hairspray as well. 
And some of them pulled it off. I think David pulled it off pretty well. Uh, some of them didn't. I mean, if you look at Ozzy in the mid 80s, look at the shot in the dark video. I mean, he's got eyeliner on, a sequin gown. He's just ridiculous. If you look at some of the periods of time that Kiss wasn't wearing makeup, they had more makeup on maybe than when they were wearing makeup. When I moved to America in 85, I watched a great deal of uh, MTV, music television. I saw all glamour, and I thought maybe a couple of streaks to, uh, to bring it a little more contemporary, and of course I turned blonde. After Still the Night exploded, Geffen Records okayed two more videos, Is This Love and Here I Go Again. We shot Is This Love on one day, and Here I Go Again on the second day. Was there budget now because the other video had done well? No, the budget was really low, so that's why we, co we combined two at once on the performance part so we could keep the crew and keep the equipment and amortize the cost over two days sure. rather than having to do two setups, two and setups yeah. to everything. We never wanted and didn't have to and weren't ever going to resort to the chick in the bikini on the chain link fence. It was never going to be like that. Marty was very tasteful and has a lot of class. I mean, look at his family and his wife. Um, they're just wonderful people and it translates into his work. I grew up in the Midwest and I have Midwestern tastes. You know, if Chicago and Ohio like it, most of the country likes it. And I always tried to be on the edge. I never wanted to do an X-rated video or anything. But I wanted to appeal to what kids were really, what rock and roll is all about. It's all about sex. So who are we kidding? And it spoke to the public because it wasn't bullshit and it wasn't pandering. The persona of the video of David Coverdale singing and Tawny Katane on that Jaguar was really the real both of them. What they were projecting was not acting, it was real. You enjoy doing your videos? <laughs> Are you kidding? <laughs> Being able to thrust my tongue down in search of Katane's uh, tonsils, yes, I do. When Is This Love hit MTV, the single shot to number two on the Billboard charts and album sales continued to skyrocket. And now it was time for Here I Go Again. The third single and video from Whitesnake's self-titled 1987 album was actually a remake of a song Coverdale had previously released on 1982's Saints and Sinners album. Co-written with former bandmate Bernie Marsden, the original version had actually charted in the UK. The feel was wildly different. And there was a lyric change. The selection of Here I Go Again for the 87 album, that was your selection. 100% right. my selection. This is a worldwide hit. From the first time I ever heard the original version, I thought that I thought it was just poorly arranged and played. Was David Coverdale an easy sell on the idea of doing Here I Go Again for the record when you brought it up to him? No. So he, it took a little bit of convincing. Yeah. Kalodner was not satisfied with the album version and felt that they could do one better. When the record was finished, I said, we, we have to try this again. This is like a... This is a worldwide hit. But there was no chance of getting that version on the album. Two things. One, the record was already getting into production worldwide. Two, Coverdale didn't want it put on the record. He thought it was a prostitution of his original work. But for the pop and top 40 stations, this was the only version. That was the, the gigantic version, which was totally a single version. And the funny thing about Here I Go Again, it was my least favorite of the three. It was completely made up, 100% made up, all gut. It was kind of an afterthought video because Is This Love was the big one. And I just said, okay, make it up and see what happens. And it went on to be go, wow, my God, I was in shock. I'm still in shock. The Jaguars, 
that was just happenstance, right? Happened out of necessity. So who owned the black Jaguar and who owned the white I Jaguar? I owned the black one. They happen to be the same model. Exactly the same. I'm a very big preparation guy. That allows me to go by my gut. I know I have a roadmap of what I want to do, and I'm going to do all that. But then if I get a gut feeling, I can add to it. it doesn't work, so what? But if it does work, that's the magic that makes the difference. You know, had he been a musician, he would have been in this band now. You know, it was that kind of rapport. And it was just a meeting of positive people. And what, we, what Marty and I call it is jazz. The word jazz is really important to Marty and David and myself. And it was so important that when David and I were talking about having kids, our first kid, we were going to name him or her jazz. And jazz came because we were doing Here I Go Again. Marty didn't know what skills I had in terms of dancing or anything. And I had been a gymnast when I was younger, and I was a ballerina. So he got Paula Abdul to come on set. We were in downtown LA by the Dorothy Chandler, and we were in a parking lot. And you've seen movie crews. I mean, we had like a hundred crew members there. Marty, D cream cheese doesn't play around. Marty Conlon doesn't play around. He gets things right. And to the point that he brings Paula Abdul, who was like the biggest name in dance, right? And he brings her for me. I get there and Paula goes, so do you know anything about dance? And, and she was so sweet. And I said, well, as a matter of fact, I used to be a gymnast and a ballerina. She goes, okay, um, why don't you get up on the cars and show me what you got? And there was Marty's black jag and mine and David's white jag. Ironically, the exact same year, the same model, everything parked. And I said, okay. And I got up on the cars and I just started doing what I did. And she turned to Marty and she said, she doesn't need me. And she left. <laughs> and so Marty goes, okay, let's just do it jazz style. Let's just jazz. And so he would, instead of saying action, he'd go jazz. <laughs> and I would just, I made that whole routine up. And he's so secure in who he is as a, as a director, he didn't need to militarily say, okay, you do this here and you do that there. He would just go, go. You know, we didn't really take it that seriously. I mean, we took our work seriously and we wanted to do something great every time, but there was no pressure. Nobody knew who they were. The only thing we had going for us to make it great was our insecurity of if it's not great, we're never going to work again. Well, if I don't top myself, I'm, nobody's going to hire me. And then when I became really expensive, that really became true. Because when you're at a certain point, you know, everybody's waiting for you to topple, especially in the music business. I wasn't about to let that happen. And if you look close at here, I go again, you'll see at one point, you can see the tag on the bottom of Tawny's shoe. She had an exposed breast that was on MTV for six months. I wish I could tell you I knew about it. I didn't do it on purpose. I didn't know about it. MTV never saw it. And all of a sudden, somebody was watching it really close, and they called me, and they said, you got to change this. I said, it's been on six months. What do you mean? So I changed it after six months. And then after those videos come out, then David and Tawny are like the couple of rock and roll. Well, he fell in love with her through the videos. Okay, and every time they would fight, he would look at a video. When did I first meet David Coverdell? I was with one of my best friends, uh, Deanie, at a table for two at La Dome. And, you know, I love guys with long hair. I love pretty boys. And Deanie, like, kind of gave me a heads up. She goes, you know, like, over your shoulder, you know, <laughs> 10 and 2. There's, you know, <laughs> two hot, you know, guys with long hair. You know, I didn't give him much thought. And... I don't know, an hour into our dinner, I got up and I walked to the restroom. One of the guys that was sitting at the table behind us got up and I guess followed me to the restroom. Hey, do you and your girlfriend want to sit with my friend and I to have a drink? Mm -hmm. And I said, you know what, I, I don't drink, so no thank you. This other guy meets me at the top of the stairs and he said, would you and your girlfriend care to join me and my friend for a cup of tea? And I said, you know what? Yes, I think we would. And he was in a suit. And I just thought, oh, my goodness. He, what a gentleman. So sweet. 
I, I never drank alcohol. Um, I still haven't. And so the do you want to get a drink line didn't work, but the do you want to get a tea did. Mm-hmm. And it, that tea line changed both of our lives. You were very familiar with the Sunset Strip bands and yes. the scene and everything, but you hadn't heard of White Snake. No, I'd never heard of White Snake. You grew up with Robin Crosby of Rat. Yes, my beloved. You know, he was my first love. You know, we were 16, 17 years old when we met. And our birthdays are day apart. He was August 4th and I'm August 5th. I left Rob to date Pete Angelus, who was the lighting director for Van Halen, who eventually became their manager. So I knew about rock and roll on the level of Van Halen during when Van Halen was God. And I lived on the bus with uh, Pete and Dave and Alex and Mike and Eddie. I mean, it got me ready for my life with uh, Whitesnake. I remember a really cute, funny little story because I knew that I wanted to be an actress, which is why I left San Diego to move to LA. And here I was walking behind Eddie and Valerie at, I think it may have been the forum, and we were getting ready to get on the bus. And I was with Pete. And I saw the back of them walking away, and I thought, "Mm mm-mm, no, I'm not, no, I'm going to be with the lead singer one day. That's going to be me. I'm going to be working, and I'm going to be married to the lead singer of the band. Someone's going to be walking behind me. (laughs) (laughs) Be careful what you wish for. Suitably enchanted with Coverdale, Katane agreed to a date. So he picks me up in this white Jaguar, and he's wearing this blue suit, And he's looking very, very dapper. He goes, hey, listen, I'm working on an album. He looked like a rock star, but (laughs) I didn't know he was a rock star because he wasn't in any of the bands I knew. So he puts in this cassette Uh and he starts playing me this album. And I just remember looking out the window going, oh, my God, I've done it again. (laughs) Another guy who thinks he's going to be a rock star. And then his car breaks down. (laughs) Perfect. He ended up having to push it to the side of the road to get (laughs) traffic. (laughs) So here I am with a guy whose car is completely broken down and a demo of a band that I've never even heard of. And I'm thinking, oh, this is not going to last. This isn't going anywhere. (laughs) (laughs) This isn't the Eddie and Valerie uh, (laughs) This isn't the Eddie and Valerie that I saw. (laughs) This isn't walking out of the bat, you know, out of the kitchen of a hotel because we're so famous. (laughs) And so the blue suit is actually, that was the one that he wore in the Here I Go Again video? That's the same suit, yes. And of course, it's the same car. It's the same car, yes. Once we started making money, I think he fixed it. When did you find out that his group wasn't an up-and-coming band that was trying to get signed, but a band that had a legacy? After the video came out? I was in the same position as everybody else. I just happened to be the one who was in the videos. It wasn't a, a long time from the videos to when he asked you to marry him, right? I know we were on the road because we were on a tour bus, mm-hmm. and it was my birthday because he asked me what I wanted for my birthday. And I said, you. And he proposed right then and there. American Top 40. Two songs away from number one. Number two. If you've seen White Snake's video, Here I Go Again, you might be thinking the woman who's in it looks very familiar. Well, that's actress Tawny Katane, and she's probably best remembered for playing Tom Hanks' bride-to-be in the movie Bachelor Party. Well, now she's a bride-to-be for real. She and White Snake's leader, Dave Coverdale, just announced their engagement. At number two for a second week in a row, here is White Snake, and here I go again. The week after the engagement was announced, Here I Go Again went right to number one. My wife and I had a wonderful private ceremony, which MTV wanted to film, and they had, and it was just so alien to me. We got married at Howard Kaufman's house, and then we had a big reception. I mean, the who's who of the music industry was at our, was at our wedding. The fans really showed me so much love. I mean, paintings and gifts and... Um, the girls, the girls were great. I knew I already had the guys, you know, but the girls, how were the girls going to react? The girls were like, we love you, you know, and, and that was, that was really validating to me. I, I loved, I loved the fact that 
they were fans too. We would do interviews for MTV. I would be there too. So I guess everybody accepted me like they would, you know, like the sixth member of, of the band. Well, she got started to get involved in band affairs from the, from the start. She was a very smart, beautiful, influential person who wanted him to be, you know, the most famous rock singer. She wanted to have a say, but she kind of pushed him out in front to make, you know, decisions on his own without any A&R or record company guy or whatever. It took a lot of artistic power away from me when he would say no to various ideas I would have. David didn't have management when I first met him. He was looking over two different managers. He was looking over Doc McGee and he was looking over Howard Kaufman. Geffen and John Claudner wanted David to go with Doc McGee. I wanted Whitesnake to go with Howard Kaufman. And I will never forget the conversation that David Geffen and I got into where he actually stands up and puts his hands on his desk and I'm sitting in the chair across from him and I get up and I put my hands on his desk and we're like two lions at each other. And I'm like, no, he's going with Kaufman. And he's like, no, he's going with McGee. I said, no, we're going with Kaufman. In addition to the band's business affairs, Katane also assisted producer Keith Olsen with the selection of vocal takes. I sat in with Keith and went over the vocals. What you do is like if it's, and here I go again, and he sings it 12 times, you know, like here in the first track, and again in the third track, you'd mark off the box, and then Keith would you know, put them all together and edit it like, you know, like a television show, sure. you know, which scene do you like and which mm -hmm. take of a particular scene. And so I got to do that on the album, which started in John Claudner's mind, the seed of Yoko Ono. Were you quoted as saying she was the Yoko Ono of the band? No, no. I would never say that. I mean, it was, they were kind of a team until right. they weren't. Well, I was also there for when they weren't. John's like, well, wait, she's, <laughs> she's picking vocals. She's just told my boss who the manager is going to be for the band. She's picked the photographer to shoot the album covers. Now she's in here arguing with me the A and B sides. But it was all working. Whitesnake's follow-up album, Slip of the Tongue, was released in November of 1989. Though he tried, it was near impossible for Kalodner to repeat the 87 success. Because the songs weren't as good and I, I just couldn't get them as good. I tried everything to try to surpass the 87 record. This guy was just so, so talented. And he and John Sykes wrote one of the best records of all time. I mean, it sold 20 million copies, I think at least. And um, I don't think they ever talked again, ever. John Sykes would have talked to David Coverdale, but... They were covered ill, said, I'm never speaking to John Sykes again. A white snake with John Sykes would have been on the level of Bon Jovi and Aerosmith. The singer or leader of the band is usually the number one obstacle, and the number two obstacle was um, Tawny Katane. He's willing to call me an obstacle, but he's not willing to admit that he called me Yoko Ono. Kalodner, if I'm not correct, blames the undoing of White Snake on Tawny Katane. When in fact, that's not true. The undoing of White Snake was David Coverdale. Earlier you said that you liked Coverdale, and then you said at the time. At the time. So, so what changed? There was a couple incidents. You only directed two of the three videos to come from Slip of the Tongue. Yeah. I had to get even. Now, here's the story. I don't think I've ever really told this on film or tape, but so help me God, this is a true story. Dave and Tawny are now married. He's now selling out arenas all over the country. And I did these videos for very little money. I did them just for love. And he had given each of the members of this band $400,000 bonuses. So Coverdale calls me up one day and says, Tawny and I want to bring you and Aliza, Aliza's my wife, your Christmas present. I said, okay. So I said to Elisa, I was the Rolls Royce going to pull up here? Or, you know, this is get even time, right? I mean, great. So he comes up with Tawny. 
and they give me a box. They say, don't open this box until we leave. I couldn't get them out of the goddamn house. All right, and we're dying to know what's in this fucking box. And finally, after about three hours, they leave, and ironically, as they're leaving, we had the MTV on. Is This Love came on, what they had that time. I think they had Top Friday videos or something like that. They said, and for a record, 31st week in a row, the number one video is Is This Love? And they drove down my driveway and out the gate. I said to her, let's bet how much the check is. She says, I'll bet it's a million dollars. I said, that's what I was going to say, because that's what I think he should have given me. He's a multi, multi-millionaire now. And he literally, they had nothing. His zero. I mean, I had to loan him the money. They all wrote him off. Wrote him off. So I opened this, gingerly opened this box. And it's a picture of David and Tawny that they had obviously gone to Rite Aid and got a frame because the picture didn't even fit. So we start tearing the goddamn picture open to look for the check. Needless to say, it ended up in the fireplace. I'm so upset. I had no idea. Maybe he said, don't open it until we leave because he didn't want me to see what was in the box. (laughs) Because the way I was spending money, are you kidding me? I wouldn't have gone cheap on anybody. I still like David, but as Hall and Oates says, there comes a time you got to draw the line and say, no can do. When David finally like pissed him off, Marty didn't need to deal with that anymore. I ended up doing a couple more videos for him and charged him over a million dollars each video, just so I could get even. But the love wasn't there. Well, he really believed his own bullshit, okay? He thought he was like the biggest star in the world. Well, in fact, he was precarious. 1989, and I'm doing a video with him in Worcester, Massachusetts. Coincidentally, I'm doing a KISS video in Worcester, Massachusetts the night before. I shoot the KISS video on Friday night. I don't say anything to anybody. And from Boston, we took David's tour bus out to Worcester. And the only ones in the bus were the driver, me and Tawny, and David. And he says to me, Marty, I heard you did a KISS video last night. How dare you? Don't you know we're Led Zeppelin of the 80s? I said, yeah, but it's 89. What are you going to do next year? I bathe in success and feel very, very uncomfortable in terms of celebrity. I am an intensely private man. And when our relationship became so visual, it made me feel distinctly uncomfortable. There was no separation. When David and I would go outside, Mm -hmm. people were coming up to me, not to him. And with that type of ego, remember, John Sykes and him, they couldn't mesh. That, right. Those egos were like, mm-hmm. and then all of a sudden, now his wife is, you know, being recognized or being asked to do more interviews than he is. Mm-hmm. He didn't like that. He eventually started complaining to, like, Jimmy Ayers, our road manager, or Peter, our butler. Yes, we had a butler. And maybe that got back to Howard Kaufman. And I'm sure Claudner had already been, like, the entire time trying to find any excuse to get me out of there because I'm sure I wasn't making him look good. Slowly but surely, boom, exit stage left. There goes Tawny Katane. Is that hand-in-hand with the divorce? I, I mean, I think so. I think so because there was no, there was nothing. I mean, still, has anyone ever heard of a story of why David and I got divorced? No. No, neither have I. When David and I split, I kept the home in Beverly Hills and he kept the house in in Tahoe. That's how we did it. It was very amicable. It was very smooth. It was very smooth. Heartbreaking, but it was smooth. What's your take on why David declined participation (laughs) in in this documentary? Um, Truthfully, I think then he would have to be reminded of what helped differentiate Whitesnake from all the rest of the bands in the 80s. He would have to confront that. And he would have to confront me. And I don't think he wants to give me any credit in any way, shape, or form. I think out of two reasons, out of one of his ego and and his voice and his vocals, and also I think out of respect for his new wife. Look, this is a really, this is a hard talk for me in the sense that 
I know I was not in that band, but I also know the impact that those videos had. Every day to this day, I get recognized on the street. I get fans on Twitter, fans on Instagram, fans on Snapchat, you name it. And everybody's like, oh my God, I loved Here I Go Again. When I hear Is This Love, I think of you. And I'm at a certain age that I should be able to say, I get it. I understand it now. And there's no ego to it. It's just the fact. Nothing has managed to get in the way of Here I Go Again, an evergreen standard that continues to grow in popularity with a video that you still can't look away from. And as David Coverdale is fond of saying, everyone has a different Here I Go Again story. Here I Go Again, I've met so many people who who said to me that song came to them at the right time in their lives when they identified with it so much, it gave them strength to go on. Host of the Eddie Trunk Podcast, Eddie Trunk. It just seems like it's kind of like a rally cry and nothing's going to keep me down sort of feeling about it. Where I get that from is the reaction to fans when they hear it or see it played. And I think that's pretty much what, you know, the biggest message is in that song to me. Mel Ryder and British person Nick Lefley. It's become a theme song for what the hell am I doing moments. I remember when I first moved to New York, walking around the waterfront in Battery City with a song in my headphones just sort of laughing to myself at the ridiculousness that this like guy from a small town in England had suddenly like moved to Manhattan. I just moved to LA from New York a month ago and even then as I was packing up the house and <laughs> putting all these boxes out the front for the Red Cross to pick up, blasting from the house was Here I Go Again by White Snake. <laughs> for the longest time I convinced myself it was like this sort of ironic thing but then you think well if no one else can hear it except me, <laughs> is that really an ironic joke or am I just secretly enjoying this quite a lot? <laughs> the video for Here I Go Again does not have the strongest narrative arc. <laughs> Model kicks legs about while rolling on various cars. <laughs> Done. <laughs> Cut. Call it a day. <laughs> I mean, it's a, it's a credit to anyone who can make rolling around on the top of a car actually look really good. I look terrible when I do it, and I should know I filmed it twice. Docker Media's executive editor for publishing partnerships and former Jalopnik executive editor, Matt Hardegree. I was probably about seven or eight. I remember seeing the Jag. I obviously remember seeing Tawny Katane, and I was like, ooh, Jaguars, neat, you know. So it started, that's sort of when it kind of, kind of hit me. Jags are famous for being luxurious, they're famous for being stately, and they're famous for older Jags for having the worst electrical systems ever put in a car. It's it's actually kind of classy for an 80s music video. It's not like a stretch Lamborghini. It's not like a terrible red Corvette or like a Firebird or a lot of the things you see in sort of hair metal band 80s music. It's just Jag is not bad. Sex and cars have been linked forever. Uh, and just if you didn't get the idea, in the video, here's Tani Katane, who's this beautiful model actress, for some reason doing somersaults between and over the cars. And then, later on in the video, if you have not made the connection between sex and cars, she's literally just making out with David Coverdale in the front seat of the car as they're driving through some tunnel in L.A. Sex, cars, you can have sex in cars. Here's a woman you'd want to have sex with in a car. Here's her later making out with a dude in a car who is also having sex with her, as we now know. Uh, it's, uh, it's perfect. Pucker and Pout co-founder and Vanderpump Rules star Katie Maloney. Here I Go Again specifically is important to me, not only because it was my ringtone, for a length of time but the reason why because i turned that into my like breakup song anthem it was empowering to me almost only strictly dated like musicians for so long that i feel like had you know i been (laughs) her age back then like i would have like followed that like credo of like i'm gonna marry a musician i'm gonna be the star of the music videos and i'm gonna like be friends with like every like manager and everything like that like i would just that was what i was drawn to what i gravitated towards for so long until i ultimately settled down but it's i mean like it was all like i was just drawn to musicians and had such a love and deep understanding of music 
that was the center of my universe. Mm-hmm. So yeah, she was my spirit animal because she was just also like hot. And it's weird to say that now because I think she looks exactly like my mom, but hey, my mom's <laughs> a babe too. It's you taking control, taking back control. And then also admitting defeat, accepting reality and responsibility. And the way that it's sung is in such a positive way that I think the combination of that mixed with Marty's imagery of me just was explosive. Few other songs have been used or referenced in film and television as often as Here I Go Again. It's Max's adventuring song and It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. Irish Mickey Ward's walk-up song in real life and in the docudrama The Fighter. And like American Dad, where they, uh, they were racing and the winner got me dancing on the car. You know, Will Ferrell um, mentioned me in Talladega Nights. I can't believe this. This is like, it's that White Snake video where the girl crawls on. Yeah, just like that. What's her name? She's quite an honor. Here I Go Again is a song that to this day, I'll still be in a supermarket or whatever, and it'll hear, you hear it come on. It's pretty much you know, still everywhere. As a matter of fact, last night, someone called me up and said, turn on this show, Greatest Hits. I said, why? He said, just turn it on. And they were playing Here I Go Again. So my manager calls me and he he said that uh, ABC contacted him and wanted to give me a Lifetime Achievement Award for what I did for Whitesnake. And they threw in there the car industry. Tony Give it up, Tony Katane. Yes! She did amazing things for the band Whitesnake and amazing things for the auto industry, too. So on behalf of that lucky car hood and a very grateful nation, Greatest Hits would like to present this greatest video babe lifetime achievement award to the one and only Tony Katane. That's yours, baby. When is the last time you've been on a car here? Oh, last week. Last week. Last week. No, seriously. Would you like to thank the lovely people? I would. Thank you so much. And you know what? Drive safely. (laughs) And now it's all over, but for the plugs. This program was written, researched, narrated, edited, engineered, and produced by Craig McNeil for Mel. And you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Videodrome Disco. My deepest, most sincere thanks to everyone who participated. And here's where you can find out more about them. John Kalodner at johnkalodner.com. Marty Kalner can be found at martykalner.com. Check out the Eddie Trunk podcast on Podcast One or go to eddietrunk.com for info on all of his shows and projects. Tawny Katane is on Twitter at Tawny underscore Katane and Instagram at Tawny Katane. Katie Maloney can be seen on every season of Bravo's Vanderpump Rules. And check out PuckerandPow.com, your daily source for beauty, style, and more. Matt Hardigree on Twitter at Matt Hardigree. Nick Lefley on Twitter at Nick Lefley. For Whitesnake and David Coverdale info and tour dates, head over to Whitesnake.com. And of course, for more about Mel, go to WeAreMel.com or find us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at WeAreMel. Mel. We're trying our best. We'll be right back.